Good day, folks, and welcome back to the channel. Hey, guys, we have any more candy? <laughs> yourself. <laughs> Antoine, what are you supposed to be? The world's biggest baby. <laughs> what the hell? Give him the hundred bucks. What do you mean give him the hundred bucks? Yeah, he wins, dude. What are you? I'm Dr. Evil from Austin Powers, see? No, Rick, you're an idiot. Give the hundred bucks to Antoine. Congrats, Twan. Yeah, sweet. Hundred bucks. Hundred dollars worth of store credit, Antoine. Good day, folks. Today, we'll show you the best of the prank moments on Pawn Stars. So, Chum, have you used it yet? Uh, not really. You want to really try it? Heck yeah, I do. Well, let's do it. You, you in? No. Antoine, no, get over no. here. You're going to play with a Ouija board. For what? So you can go home and teach your kids how to play with one. I'm not into this. <laughs> let's give it a shot. All right, so the way this works usually is you put your index and your middle finger on the planchette, and then we have to ask the question. They want to ask, um, oh, is uh, Chum Lee going to own the pawn shop one day? Are you moving it? No. I'm not touching it. Huh. <laughs> the responsibility. <laughs> Thank responsibility. God. I'm out of here, bro. <laughs> it's totally cool. New Odd Couple. In this Pawn Stars compilation, Rick and Chum Lee showcase their odd couple dynamic through a series of pranks. Chum Lee, known for getting under Rick's skin without repercussions, surprised Rick with a homemade USS Chump submarine and cleverly borrowed money using a promissory note. All right, I think I can figure that out. What in the hell are you doing, Chum Lee? Building something for your son. Hey, there he is. What's this? Check it out, the USS Chum. That submarine you always wanted. Um, that is the dumbest looking submarine I ever seen in my life. You ordered yourself food and you don't have no money. Well, I thought I had my wallet here, but I left my wallet in my house. I thought I was in my car. Just anyways, because I borrowed 20 bucks. Hold on. I got the pizza on the way already. Here, sign that. What is that? It's a promissory note. Proof that you borrowed $20 from me. You will get this note back when you pay me back. Now sign that. So whoever holds that note, I got to pay 20 bucks to? It's the way promissory notes work. Do you understand? You get this back when you pay me back. Where's the promissory note I had you sign? You owe me 20 bucks now, because I bear the promissory note. The humor extended to the workplace, where Chum Lee created a board game called Chum Life and suggested amusing scenarios, such as wrecking the boss's truck for lunch. Despite the mischief, the camaraderie between Rick and Chum shone, making them the entertaining duo at the pawn shop. You're making a board game now? Yeah, it's called Chum Life. There's nothing on it, Chum. I was hoping you guys would kind of help me, you know, fill the squares out and get the idea of the game a little bit. What about um, takes boss's truck to get lunch and wrecks it? These lighthearted moments captured the playful lessons of their relationship and added a humorous touch to the show. Chum versus Corey prank battle. In the ultimate prank battle between Chum Lee and Corey, tensions arose as Corey tricked Chum Lee into thinking that he won $10,000 on a fake scratcher ticket. I know how you like these. I picked you up a scratch card, dude. Oh, sweet. I love these things. Match three like amounts, win that amount. All right, I'm feeling lucky. Chum keeps talking about winning the lottery, and there's just no way it's gonna happen. So I thought I'd screw with him a little bit. All right, I got a 10,000 and a 50. All right, another 10,000. Chum, the odds are highly against it. What's that say? Holy 10,000. It's $10,000. It's 10,000 bucks! 10,000! I don't need this. You guys can have that shirt. I don't need to work anymore. I'm rich. I'm, I'm going on vacation. Excited about his supposed windfall, Chum Lee started making extravagant plans, like buying a ticket to the Cayman Islands. Unaware of the prank, Chum Lee texted Corey about his extravagant purchase. Chum, it's Corey, man. Give me a call as soon as you can. We really gotta talk, dude. It's really, 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 really important, Chum. Give me a call. Voicemail again. I can't get a hold of him. I tricked Chum into thinking he won $10,000 on a scratcher ticket. 10000 <laughs> and he's been missing ever since. I'm starting to get worried that he's gonna go nuts and max out his credit card. You gotta get a hold of him and tell him this is a prank. He's gonna spend a bunch of this money and he's gonna be screwed. All right, hold on, Chum just texted me. What? Call you back in 20 minutes just buying a ticket to the Cayman Islands. I won't have to pay taxes on the money there. I don't know what on earth Corey was thinking. It's becoming painfully obvious he did not think this one through. And now, as I predicted, it's gotten out of control. Realizing the situation was spiraling out of control, Corey panicked and tried to convince Chum Lee that it was just a joke. Chum, yeah. Yo, what's up, bro? You want me to get a ticket for you? 
I wish, buddy, man. The ticket was just a joke, dude. It was one of those gagged lottery tickets. Chum, you don't have $10,000. The ticket is fake. It was a joke. Dude, I'll, I'll, I'll pay for the Cayman Island tickets if you can't get a refund, buddy. I didn't, I didn't think you would act this fast. Why would you do this to me? Just get back, just come back to work, dude. I didn't. I'm sorry, Chum. I'm sorry, buddy. Alright, I'm on my way. All right, bye, buddy. Sorry, man. Oh, does someone feel a little bit bad now? I hope it costs you $5,000 for his friggin' tickets. This is what happens when you joke around, son. In the end, Chum Lee caught on, revealing that he knew that it was a prank all along. Corey, open for a simple laugh, found himself on the receiving end of an unexpected day off for Chum Lee, who turned the tables in this hilarious showdown. So how much did the ticket cost? I'll pay you back for it. The ticket? You think your little fake lottery ticket fooled me? Come on, big hoss. So you knew it was a joke? the whole time. And I knew that ticket was fake. I get those all the time. I hand those out to people that are funny. So what have you been doing all day? Taking the day off, having a green smoothie. So you used a joke just to take the day off. You try to take advantage of me, big hoss. Don't be mad at backfired. Chum Lee spends $5,000. In a hilarious episode of Pawn Stars, Chum Lee spent $5,000 on what the old man called the stupidest thing. In 1986, Buick Regal turned lowrider. This is what I called you about. All right, it's a Buick Regal with a paint job. This thing is awesome. The Regal, when you hit the block, man, you're, you're it. I want to hit the block today. I came down to the pawn shop today to sell my 86 Buick Regal. I got seven cars right now, so I just need to make this space. I'm trying to get like 2,500 just so I don't get hit over the head, but I might walk off with like 2,000. I'm not too, I'm not too worried about it. Nadir, the seller, customized the car with flashy paint and pillow seats. Despite Corey's skepticism, Chum Lee insisted on the purchase, believing it was a great deal. So what can you tell me about it, man? This is American luxury right here. I changed out the seats, the steering wheel, the stereo. Then we did the paint, put these traditional lowrider patterns on it. I changed the rims. It used to have a V6 in it. I swapped it out and put the V8. It's a 305. Everything you can pretty much do to it is pretty much done. I think I might be in love. You know, you're supposed to pretend like you don't like it when you're buying it. You know what? For some reason, older Buick Regals are cars people just love to customize. They put a big chunk of money into pricey wheels and custom paint jobs, but it really doesn't up the value of the car at all. You gotta come check out the interior. The interior is where it's at, man, because that's you're inside the car. That's what you want to look at. Those pillow seats inside? Yeah, you know, we go way back with pillow backs and Cadillacs, so we took the Cadillac seats out and put them in the Regal. That's sweet. Pretty cool. Yeah, you're a good salesman, man, but what do you want for the car? Give me 2500 man. It's hard for me to tell you this, man, because I know you put $10,000 into this car at least, but realistically, I'm seeing a $1,000 car here. My tires are worth $1,000. You're crazy, dude. I'll go up to 12. I won't, so come on, man. We gotta work this out. You gotta meet me at like 2000 or something. At the end of the day, we got one of the most common cars that GM ever built. It's cool that you made the car what you wanted, but I gotta make money off of, and I'm not seeing dollars here. I can do 1500, I can't go no more. Can't do it, man. 1500 is not where we're at on this car. Can't happen like that. I just can't do it, man. Thanks for coming down, I appreciate nah, I it. Nice to meet you. No, 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 no. It's 500 bucks. You got two grand to pay the man, pay him. I ain't doing it. You wanna buy yourself a car? I'll tell you right now, $2,000, if you like the car, it's not a bad deal. You ain't gonna make any money off it. Oh man, here we go again. Chum always falls in love with stuff that comes in the shop. But as long as he doesn't pay more than about two grand, he's getting a good deal. Shit starts up, it's a deal. All right, let's see. Pop that hood. I hope it starts, homie. Yeah! We got a deal. Let's do it. Let's do it. You know, it's not what I wanted, but it's OK. I'm not too worried about it. He's happy. I'm happy. Let me get my keys. Yeah. We got some big plans for this. Later on, Chum Lee approached Danny and requested the installation of hydraulics to add an extra thrill. The old man and the rest of the crew found the hydraulics absurd, but Chum Lee was thrilled to showcase the car's bouncing capabilities. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah, I knew you guys would be excited. It's a damn Buick Regal. I like it. I like it. She looks great. She came out wonderful. Well, it doesn't look like anything was done to it. Danny, what'd he pay? Well, between parts and labor, you're probably about three grand in it. Sweet. Something like that, yeah, absolutely. Wh where did the three grand go? You spent more on it than you paid for it, and I can't tell, well, what'd you do to it? Let me just show you guys. You ready?
That was the most stupidest thing I ever seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now here's a special treat for you, old man. <laughs> oh my God. I told you guys you would like it. So what did you do to it? He juiced it up. Chumley's car is what they call juiced, and that's when you're running all the hydraulic fluid and all the pumps and everything in it so that he can flip those switches and make the car bounce around. The episode unfolded with laughter as Chumley, excited about his juice ride, took the old man for a bumpy journey. You look good in that, Chumley. See you later, Pops. Don't see you later. I need to ride back to the shop. See you guys later. I got the old man. Chumley, you hit those hydraulics, I will kill you. I just need to do this last thing, boss, so we can drive properly. Damn it, Chumley. Hold on, I just want to show you the full potential of the vehicle. Yeah, let's get out of here, boss. Let's go. I'm going to put some music on, boss. No, you ain't What do you want to listen to? Get it back on the ground and take me home. Chumley and Corey bet. In this episode, Chumley and Corey made an interesting bet over the price of a Filipino bolo knife from the Insurrection War. Chumley purchased the knife for $600 from Spencer, and Corey was convinced that it was worth much less. The bet was set. If Chum was right, Corey had to walk Pinky the dog in a tutu. What are you looking to do with it? You know, you usually bring stuff in here for Rick, and he's not here, but I figured a thousand bucks, man. I mean, something like this, that's hard to price and you can't find, there's no comparables out there. First off, I don't know too much about it. Normally call someone, but I'm guessing it's probably some worth somewhere in maybe like the $500 range. Yeah, a little more than $500, man. 850. 500, that's the most I'm gonna give you. Seven, see now I'm getting hard, now see I've come off so much and you're just not bringing it up enough. That's, you know, still gonna be a lot. My wall, 600 bucks, that's it, I'm walking. Let's call, you don't wanna see it somewhere else and get Rick all mad. All right, I'll give you 600 bucks for it. All right, man, you're tough, you're tough, man. No, you're tough. Right. I'm gonna get fired for this. I just bought something for what it's probably worth. <laughs> no, man, I think you guys are gonna do great with this. All right. All right, man, I'll see you up front. What are you doing? Wrapping up an item for customers gonna take it home with them. Okay, chum, that stuff costs money. Stop, stop, it's wrapped. It's a piece of art. It's wrapped. What's this? A Philippine war knife. Where'd you buy this? I bought it from Spencer, your dad's buddy. What'd you pay for it? 600. Chum, this is worth like maybe 200 bucks. 200 plus about 800. That thing's easily worth $1,000 if not more. I know it's not worth that. I'll bet you. Bet me what, chum? That I'm right? I know I'm right. I bet you it's worth $600 or more. And if I'm right, you're walking pinky in a tutu. Cool, and if I'm right, you're cutting your ponytail off with this thing. I'd never cut my ponytail off, but I'll accept that bet because I know I'm right. If you wanna make the bet, make the bet. But I'm telling you, it's a bad idea. You are willing to bet your hair. Yeah, I, there's no way I'm wrong. I'll happily bet my ponytail. You're gonna be losing your hair, man. However, when an expert, Alex, examined the knife and revealed its historical significance tied to the 26th Infantry Regiment, the value was estimated at a thousand dollars. Chumley won the bet, and Corey hilariously fulfilled his end of the bargain by taking Pinky for a walk and a tutu. Alex, I'm <laughs> glad you're here. Check out this score I've got. Philippine war knife. They call this a barong. Yes, they do. Me and Chum have a bet. What's it worth? What's the bet on? I bought that from your buddy Spencer. He came in and you weren't around. Yeah, and Chum paid 600 bucks for it. He thought I overpaid. It's worth about 300 bucks, right? Well, these are actually really popular with collectors, but what's really cool is this little label here. The 26th Infantry Regiment, that's when it was formed in the Philippines for the Philippine insurrection. So this is a, a legendary infantry regiment, a regiment that's still in service today. These guys were in, in the beginning of World War I. They were some of the first troops in France. Same thing with World War II. They're at the Battle of the Kazarine Pass. And this early date, 1899, I mean, this could have been one of their first battles ever. That totally affects the value. If this were just a barong in this, it's, you know, $500 knife maybe, but with this and tied to the 26th Infantry Regiment, I think it's like, you probably get a thousand bucks for it. Boom. Damn it. All right, so what did you guys bet or whatever? Corey has to walk Pinky in a tutu. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, let's get this over with. Oh, okay. Oh, that's a walk right there. <laughs> Wait, turn around, let me get a picture of you guys. Corey, I really think you should get a small dog. What do you think, Rick? <laughs> <laughs> I'm done now. You know what, Corey? Pinky's not enjoying this walk. It's cool if you finish up now. Just take her back inside. I can't believe you got to wear that. You lost a bet. You know how I will never forgive friends. you for this, chum. <laughs> he offered me $1,000 to get out of it. Pictures are worth more than $1,000. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Corey gets mad. In this episode, Corey and Rick engage in a heated discussion 
over a boat purchase. Corey had bought a Chris Craft boat for $16,500 without consulting Rick. If you'll take 16.5, I can do it. That's that's really the best I can do. Okay, 16.5, you got a deal. Right now, I couldn't be happier. I mean, this boat's not in bad condition. It just needs a little work. When confronted, Corey defended his decision, but Rick disapproved of the purchase, expressing frustration at Corey's failure to follow the established rule of testing everything before buying. Corey defended his autonomy and decision making, stating that he spent the money as instructed. Pops, what is Corey doing looking at a boat? I have no idea, son. We don't buy boats. The reason we don't invest in boats is, is because they're holes in the water you throw money into. They're expensive. There's no money to be made. What were you doing out there with that boat? I bought it. What do you mean you bought it? I bought it. It's... What do you How mean? How would you pay for it? 16.5. Test drive it? No. What do you mean, no? No, I didn't test drive it. It's a Chris Craft. The thing's worth like 30 grand. I could give a f It's a Chris Craft. He doesn't spend that kind of money until he asks me first. Don't ask the old man. Don't ask anybody else. You ask me. The argument escalated as Rick emphasized the potential financial risks of Corey's actions. Despite Corey's assurance of making money, Rick insisted on proper procedures and expressed concern about the impact of such decisions on the company. Corey, you know, you you sit here and you tell me all this where I'm supposed to like take this over, but every time I make a decision, you got something to say. Well, I, yeah, when you make a stupid decision, yeah. No, no, what's the real issue, dude? Didn't test drive it. Yeah. The rule is we test every f thing. I was in a parking lot. It doesn't take many stupid decisions like this to sink a company. It is my f money. No, we're going to make plenty of f money, dude. No, seriously, Dad, what do you want me to f do? Of course. It's, not, it's yours and the old man's. It's the f stores that you tell me to spend. Uh, Let him walk away. No, ask me. Honey, you f this, dude. F over the f Ouija board deal. In the Pawn Stars clip, a customer named Niels brought in a vintage 1919 Ouija board to sell. Chum Lee couldn't resist joking about the spirit spelling out his name during a demonstration. Niels explained that he won the Ouija board in a magic auction, but didn't want it in his house due to his belief in ghosts. Hello, how you doing? Good, how are you? Amazing, what can I do for you today? Uh, I wanna sell this uh, Ouija board. A real Ouija board. It is, it is in fact. It's a 1919 Ouija board. Can we take it out? Absolutely. Wow, it looks like in great condition. I remember playing with this as a kid. You know, you would ask it questions like, who's the greatest pawn broker ever to live? C, H, <laughs> U, M. Obviously, it's trying to spell Chum Lee because I'm the best employee Rick's ever had. I have a 1919 Ouija board that I'm trying to sell. I believe in ghosts, so I don't want this thing in my house. I'm hoping to sell my Ouija board for $195. Chum Lee expressed interest in buying it, prompting him to call in an expert, Murray, to assess its value. This one looks definitely early, you know, probably in the early 1900s. It's just 1919 on the back of the box. Okay, so that's the copyright date, so this could have been a little older than that. So, clearly you want to get rid of it. Are you trying to give it to me for free? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, I want to sell it. And how much are you looking to get? Um, I'll say like $195. Okay, um, it's not out of the realm. I know that this kind of stuff can be very valuable, but I'm gonna have to have someone come down and take a look at it and tell me what they think it's worth and if they think it's actually from the early 1900s. Okay. As Murray provided historical insights into Ouija boards, Chum Lee playfully convinced his colleague Antoine to join a spirit session. The scene captured the lighthearted banter and Chum Lee's humorous attempt to incorporate a paranormal appraisal into the negotiation process. So Chum, have you used it yet? Uh, not really. You wanna really try it? Heck yeah, I do. Well, let's do it, you, you in? No. Antoine, get over no. here. You're gonna play with a Ouija board. For what? So you can go home and teach your kids how to play with one. I'm not into this. <laughs> Let's give it a shot. All right, so the way this works usually is you put our index and our middle finger on the planchette, and then we have to ask the question. We want to ask, um, oh, is uh, Chum Lee going to own the pawn shop one day? Are you moving it? No. I'm not touching it. Huh. <laughs> the responsibility. <laughs> Thank responsibility. God. I'm out of here, bro. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally cool. Ultimately, Chum Lee successfully bargained with Niels, securing the Ouija board for $65. So, you were asking for $195. Murray says it's worth about $125. Would you take $50 bucks for it? We can do $90. $90. $90 is still going to be a little too much for me. Would you be able to do $65? That's going to be about where I'm at. 
You got a deal. All right, sounds good. Halloween contest. In the Halloween episode of Pawn Stars, the costume contest unfolded with hilarious antics, as Rick, the old man, Corey, Chum Lee, and surprise entrant Antoine showcased their outfits. Chum Lee, dressed as Justin Bieber, claimed to be America's heartthrob, but his pronunciation confusion added to the humor. What's up, Grandpa? Where's your costume at? Yeah. Corey, that's not a costume. Yeah, it is. It's finally time to judge the costume contest, and I think I got this one locked down. I've seen these guys around the shop all day long, and I still don't know who they're supposed to be. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, what are you supposed to be? It's obvious I'm Justin Bieber, America's heartthrob. Bieber? The Bieber. The women go crazy for him. They go crazy over a beaver? No, the Bieber. Try it. The Bieber. The Bieber. There's no V. The Bieber. Beeb, Beeb, the Beeb. Whatever. Corey, as Rooster Cogburn, faced teasing for the original or remake choice. Meanwhile, Rick, attempting to be Dr. Evil, Face accusations of cheating as the judge. What are you supposed to be? Roy Rogers? I'm Rooster Carburn from True Grit. The original or the remake? They remade it? Yeah, they remade it, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> well, Corey, at least you dressed up this year. Looks like they gave him the axe. Shut up, Chum. The important thing is I won, right? Give me my hundred bucks. If anybody won, it's me. You look like a priest from Star Trek. No, I'm Dr. Evil. Rick, you can't win. You're the damn judge. Yeah, that's cheating. The unexpected star was Antoine, dressed as the world's biggest baby, stealing the show. The laughter intensified as Antoine won the $100 store credit, prompting humorous reactions from the rest of the cast, making it a memorable and comical Halloween contest at the pawn shop. Hey, guys, we have any more candy? <laughs> <laughs> Antoine, what are you supposed to be? The world's biggest baby. <laughs> what the hell? Give him the hundred bucks. What do you mean give him the hundred bucks? Yeah, he wins, dude. What are you? I'm Dr. Evil from Austin Powers, see? No, Rick, you're an idiot. Give the hundred bucks to Antoine. Congrats, Twan. Yeah, sweet. Hundred bucks. Hundred dollars worth of store credit, Antoine. Chum Lee scheme. In a Pawn Stars episode, a unique self-lighting and extinguishing lantern from 1858 sparked Rick's interest. Hey, how can I help you? Make me a rich man. So you want me to make you a rich man by buying this? Of course. Rossler and Faye self-lighting and extinguishing lanterns. Patented May 18th, 1858. I've asked around people who deal in old things like that. No one has ever seen another one like it. Okay. Well, it looks like you both deal with old things. Maybe you should go have a drink together. <laughs> but he insisted to make a deal due to the absence of concrete proof that it was a patent model. Hey, it's pretty interesting. It's uh, the patent thing is neat. Is it a big deal to get the patent? Well, back then it was. I mean, this is 1858 and this is patent number 20,302. So that's 65 years in and we got 20,000 patents. Yeah, we're only at 10 million or so today. Yeah. They just didn't issue that many patents back then. I mean, it was probably in, uh, in 1858. Yeah, I'd be surprised if they did 1,000 patents that year. Nowadays, there's over, well over 1,000 patents a day submitted to the patent office. And it was innovation like this that um, changed the world. It really did. Meanwhile, Chum Lee sees the opportunity to unveil his get-rich-quick scheme, trademark in his name. He engaged in a humorous exchange with Rick, claiming ownership of the intellectual property and threatening trademark infringement lawsuits. Sean, what are you doing? Just researching. Researching what? How to patent my name. You can't patent a name. You can trademark a name. A patent is when you invent something. Well, I'm about to invent a way to make money off my name. Because it's patented, trademarked, whatever. That's my vision. Just get, get paid for being Chun Li. That is not how it works. If you're gonna trademark something, you actually have to get a trademark, which I do not think you qualify for. I do. I checked. Are you for sale? 
You can rent my time. I'm not going to go any further with this conversation. Well, go ahead. Enjoy saying my name while it's free. OK, Chumley with a Y, is that OK? That's already trademarked. They can sue me then. Rick, amused by Chumley's attempt, questioned the legitimacy of the trademark and the spelling on the jar. The scene captured the playful banter and Chumley's comical attempt at creating a revenue stream through trademarking, adding a lighthearted touch to the negotiation process. So how is the trademark coming? It's coming along great. Looks like I'm going to be rich in no time. So you're trademarking Chumley? Yes, I am. And you can go ahead and add right there. Add what? Some money to the trademark infringement fund. You're saying my name without proper written consent by myself, the owner of the intellectual property, Chum Lee. What are you two arguing about now? I I'm not arguing about anything. Um, Chum has. That's two times. Chum Lee, Chum Three, Lee, Chum Lee. Four, five. That's trademark infringement. You know what? You have your lawyer call my lawyers and we'll see how it all goes. You're using my name in trade. You're trading information about my intellectual being, OK? Now, you think it's funny? We'll see how funny it is when my lawyers contact your team of lawyers. It's pretty amazing he's trying to charge you for using his name. No, the amazing part is that on his little jar there, he spelled infringement right. <laughs> this is where we'll end our video. We hope you enjoyed watching it. Make sure to comment and hit that like and subscribe button too. Hit that notification bell for more videos like this. Share this video to your family and friends. See you soon.